Hi everyone, welcome to Morning Matcha. Today's guest is Josephine Goob, who's the CEO of TechFugees, a company catalyzing the tech industry to find solutions for the refugee situation. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for welcoming me here. So nice to meet you and be here with you. I love your energy already. You're so <laughs> laid back and I just can't wait to dive in and get to know you a little better. Me too. <laughs> so you started Migrate mm -hmm. before becoming the CEO of Tech Fugees, but I want to get into what inspired you to dive into this subject in the beginning. Um, there are different moments mm -hmm. uh, in my life that um, have built up to me getting into that topic. Um, I know are there people specific like... times that you remember? Yeah. Or, okay, that's amazing. I'd love um, to hear about first that. First is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. I'm from a town um, in the north of France, near Normandy, but especially a few kilometers away from Calais. And it's a city that is 33 kilometers away from the UK. Mm. So when you're in Calais, basically, you can see the shores of the UK. Mm. Um, and it's an important thing because a lot of people come through that port to get to the UK and a lot of undocumented migrants mm -hmm. is the closest point of access. So I've always seen undocumented migrants um, around the city trying to illegally go to the UK and they're pushed to be illegals. Um, and we'll get into that. So that was where the context in which I grew up seeing other people being outcasts mm -hmm. and having to go on lorries, die sometimes and hide there to get to the UK. What were what about your family's views on that? Oh just as a kid? Um well, um I can tell you about the views of my parents today. I mean parents are super atypical, uh, open minded people mm -hmm. they we're from a super small town it's 1000 people but they're super open minded that, that's 1000 people wow yeah it's super small i yeah. was very bored mm -hmm. my mom hates me when i say that and she's like you shouldn't say that it's a boring town it's not nice for us <laughs> and i'm like well but that's the reality it was really bored yeah but i was happy to have them as parents because they would bring books and knowledge my dad is like uh, a bookworm is like mm. getting all these books so I would discover the world through the internet through books through whatever my bro my dad wrote um, so they're super open-minded about it and they just they just my dad I would say um, will tell you that it's like there's a wall now being built in Kelly to prevent mm. people from going to the port which is ridiculous mm -hmm. Um and he's like, this is like we're in uh, RDA, which is the ex um, Republic Democratic of Germany, or mm. I don't know how you call it, but it's like seeing the Berlin, Berlin Wall being built within the city. And it's it's his view, and it's the same view I have. I'm ashamed that they're putting physical wall in a city. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So there's that. There's this degrading context in which I grew up for people that just want to have better lives. Yeah. Um, there's a year I spent working in New York where I was uh, helping migrant minorities uh, to get access to healthcare through my work. And I got to uh, see and understand and get knowledge of why do they not have access to healthcare and how can, what can we do about it? So I learned a lot. Um, and this is... In New York, you did this for... 2008 and 9. 2008 and 9? Yeah. And this was um, global. You were helping. It was part of a PR company that was helping those healthcare companies uh, get into um, the like social work with migrants. Mm -hmm. um, so I was doing a lot of like the work, but it was you know, an internship. I was 20 years old. So it's not like I was deciding or having a strategic role there. I was yeah. just like seeing and listening to mm -hmm. a lot of stuff, which I really appreciated that 
year spent. And for you, you had universal health care, right? Yeah, I for, had. So we do. For you, you were like, why yeah. is this the thing? Right? Yeah. yeah. I was very, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and I would see the workings of the healthcare companies trying to get onto a market and address the needs of migrants, but like driven by the money also. Uh, and so it was, it was, it was so interesting to get some critical thinking going. Mm-hmm. Um, this, the last thing that really got me into that is I moved to London to do my master's to study there. And, uh, in so, political science. Yeah. Mm-hmm. L- well, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was the London school of economics. Mm-hmm. Um, and I studied geography in the geography department. And it was about development and urban development. Wow. How cities in especially developing countries are developing. Mm-hmm. What it means. Because before that, I had done a master's in urbanism. I was fascinated by New York and I was like, I want to study cities. Yeah. And I want to see this flow of people coming in like migrants mm-hmm. in the cities and how it's a powerful um, in machine, a powerful factory of creating society and communities. Uh, and that moment when I was at the London school, first I was impressed, shocked, surprised. I don't know what word of the number of international students, especially coming from Asia. It was just like, this is, this is what the world should look like more. Yeah. It's like we're, we're, we're not just Europeans. We're like a global family. Um, and the shock was new laws were being put in place, um, on immigration. They were, they were, yeah. yeah. Theresa May, who's mm-hmm. now the prime minister of the UK at the time was at the Elm office. And she decided that international students, um, I mean, she put new laws that were restrictive on immigration and I was absurd. She was telling international student to, I can't swear, right? You totally can okay. go for it. I love swearing. <laughs> <laughs> to go fuck themselves uh, after graduation, if they couldn't, um, find a job that was, um, a job not in tension on the job market uh, and mm. that was not paid enough because then they were like taking the job of other students in the UK, which is such a way of thinking, you know, putting scarcity in your mind yeah. is like the a poison. Mm-hmm. If you think scarcity exists in that sense of there's a job market and it has a number of jobs and it doesn't create any jobs. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So um, when she did that, I saw a lot of my friends not being able to stay, mm. even though they paid three times more fees than I did, even though they were smarter than me. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Where this, did they go? What did, so they graduated they went back and, home. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. And, I was just, this is ridiculous. And then I fell in love with someone who was also <laughs> not getting a visa. And I was like, shit, <laughs> if he goes back, that's, yeah. uh, that's going to be shit. Yeah. Um, but, and that's when I started digging into like, why do we treat other human beings differently and not see their value? I mean, le constat, the, the, the thing is, if people want to come to your country I think this idea that they come to take in, to take, is is absurd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll take some, but they'll also give back. Yeah. And, and that's about how you want your society to be. If you think that people are coming to take and not to give, then there's something wrong about your society. Your mentality. At first, mm-hmm. your mentality. Mm-hmm. But it means that within your society, there's, the bo- there's this behavior already. Mm-hmm. Because you already have it in your mind so um and i think it's very reflective of the uk which i really like but my time there i was there's a certain behavior of like taking and not giving that i was that was really weird for me as a french person interesting do you have any examples like um or have you seen that in the u.s Um, that we can I have not seen that in the U.S. In the U.S. Mm-hmm. is very different. I think you have in your DNA a very entrepreneurial mm-hmm. uh, spirit. And so you see opportunities. You're go-getters. 
you see big. I mean, these all are cliche, but it's really part of your DNA. Yeah, immigrants. it's like the American dream that everyone hopes. Yeah, even though it's yeah. not. I don't know if it's good bald. or bad. Yeah, yeah. It, and and I don't think we should say this is better. Yeah, I just really like that vibe of always looking for going after things yeah. and having this energy. And it complements other, and it's great. Yeah, like you were saying, if the students, or if they didn't make them feel that way, and they were empowered to create something yeah. of their own, and to, mm -hmm. that's giving. Yeah. That's giving to a country, right? Yeah. And you're giving so, them yeah. a position in society, and you tell them the rules. It's just, you say, well, you're going to be able to contribute to that country, and it's great. Like, immigrants move to places where there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. They don't come if your country is not interesting they yeah. don't go to uh, and, so it's and, flattering and so it's flattering it's it's always to to welcome refugees is an honor it's almost a principle because these people have been forced to migrate it's very different from migration that is chosen mm -hmm. um but it's an honor because they're human beings that need to be sheltered from um from death right? mm -hmm. um migration on the other side is people want to have their dreams in your country and it's so it's it's flattering mm -hmm. um but not everyone sees it this way and it's fine but it's just how you want your society to be so that yeah, yeah. to finish on uh, on the uk um when the brexit happened because this conversation about immigration started in 2011 2012 with Theresa may and it got worse and worse every year and as i was working for migrate I was more and more pushing this idea like, God, we're going to push this company really far because we need to to fight what's happening on the political level. And I don't want to be a politician. I'm not here to mm -hmm. do that. I'm only going to do it with tech mm -hmm. because that's the disruptor. Mm -hmm. That's where we can do politics, but by acting. Mm -hmm. But when the Brexit happened, I was just like, you know what? Like, fuck you. That was I'm two moving. years ago. Yeah. I'm moving out. And I moved out of the UK. I could not tolerate that this country had come, found the political um, leadership had come to that point. And especially their reaction of the, uh, after the, the Brexit of their leaders, Nigel Farage, the morning of the Brexit saying, I never said that we would pay back, like the EU took the money and, and we'll find back that money to pay for the NHS, complete irresponsibility was, I was just like, this is, this mm -hmm. is just taking it to another level of hypocrisy. And so it showed me that they were absolutely not, those politicians were not serving the cause of the betterment the pe of yeah. their people. They just wanted to stay in their position and protect the system. Mm -hmm. And I, I did, I just didn't like that design of the system. So let's talk about the people. Yeah. Do they want it? I mean, they voted for it. It's it's kind of like in the US <clears throat> right now, right? Yes. I I think it reflected. And uh, let's get into some of the reasons why, like the yeah. fear, right? There's Is fear. Fear. And do you think it mainly has to do with terrorism? Or I don't what do you, think so. What do you think? Because... I, that's what my initial thought would be, but that's because it, I come from Muslim descent. I'm not, uh, I don't. That's how you feel about that's it. That's how I feel about it. They really, really. But I think I, that good. everyone brings, again, it's all subjective. Everyone brings their own. Yeah. You're bringing um, your own, but yeah. that you feel this way, that you feel as a Muslim, that and that's you're being seen in his own country too. Well, because in our country, I feel, um, you know, it's not a terrorist or it's not terrorism unless that person happens to be Muslim. So all these shootings, all these things that are going on. Well, if that person happened to be Muslim, it would be terrorism. Yeah. So I wonder what the climate's like in the UK and across Europe. Tough topic for me to, to say anything. We all have subjective views on this. Mm -hmm. And. But maybe <sighs> yours isn't as you. tainted as mine, you know? What do you mean by tainted? Like, not tainted, but like, I don't know. I feel like you probably see it a little more clearly just being in the industry and having been so... I'm going to try to be clear. I just find the whole terrorism threat a complete... Um, um, what's the night? The word, exact word I want to express. Um, absurd. Mm -hmm. 
um, of course, we don't know what's happening. Like all the surveillance that is made by the state and to protect us is really important. And I'm sure we don't hear of all the stories of yeah. threats that were happening and that all this. Prevented. And I'm really grateful mm -hmm. for for them not to talk about it. For those every every layer of people and society that is working towards fighting terrorism. Mm -hmm. And fighting terrorism is what is fighting that the whole the whole in the void, the emptiness of some people that have like been lost by their communities. And then turned and then to... turned into radicalism, mm -hmm. right? So it it is from the social worker that will just work really well with someone to have them back into the community, to the policeman, to everyone. Huh? So but statistically, the number of people that died of terrorism is Super small. I am not saying that it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. it's a small number of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I am not saying that it doesn't have an effect on the mind because fear then spread because it can happen anywhere. And it's because it's quite surprising as an event. Mm -hmm. But your chances of ending up in a terrorist attack statistically is super low compared to falling into your own shower. Mm. So we need to put things in perspective. And I hate how instrumentalized, how manipulative some people have been with terrorism to make it something that should be on the mind of people mm -hmm. because you're instillating darkness and the fear of other and the fear of the fear of what could happen. Like that's not a way mm -hmm. to help people grow. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was, I'll tell you, I, there's two things that I hated about this. I came back to Paris after the attacks. Um, that was terrible. Like uh, the way my friends were affected. I really insist that what it does and provoke in the mind is far bigger than the death it provokes almost. Mm -hmm. So it's really dangerous. This The trauma from it. The trauma, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there were everywhere then in train stations and airports what to do in case of an attack on billboards. So get it. You go to the airport and you write, you read mm -hmm. what to do in terms of like, it's almost like putting every day on your door, you need to think of an attack. Yeah. And that's a very dangerous power of manipulating public opinion that a threat is mm -hmm. imminently coming and it's um, not empowering people it's making them powerless and mm -hmm. paralyzed i hate that yeah that was the thing that shocked me after it's like this is totally not a way and and i probably the intention was like today what to do and so yeah. I inform wanting people. to but you know going about it in a different way and then there was tv spots and stuff there's a way to do it there's a way to have another conversation about it. What, that do, you, makes what people resilient. do you suggest? Do you have any ideas? Let's brainstorm. <laughs> I think having this conversation yeah. about what is the effect of this is really important. Then I don't know. I have, I don't have this. I, I should, I should never try to let like thoughts like this and not have a solution. But I think first is the, um, um, is the realization is the consciousness awareness of what's happening when you do that. I think it's really important. So first thing. The second thing I wanted to say, and I forgot. <laughs> I don't remember. Well, anyway. I'll ask you something. Maybe it'll come to you. You, the way that you're speaking and the specific words that you're choosing yeah. may, um, make me realize you definitely like do a lot of work on yourself. <laughs> Right. I do. <laughs> no one would speak this way unless they have done a lot of internal work. Yeah. And do you have a spiritual practice? Do you? Um, um, <laughs> um like, are you, my, yeah, what do you? My spiritual practice is reading Shomsky, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Spinoza. Mm -hmm. uh, I read a lot of philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I mean, to get into, like you mentioned, you're interested in the psychology behind why yeah. this is all happening too. Yeah. Psychology, neuroscience, like psychology is not a bad word, but I feel sometimes psychology goes into more of um, not pure science, but more like ways we talk about people's moods and emotion mm -hmm. without being exact. I like things that are a the bit depth. more em 
empirique, empirical, and mm -hmm. that are demonstrated to be truth by mm -hmm. science, even though everything is always approximate. Um, so I, my, I'm a complete atheist. Um, my dad is the worst atheist because he, <laughs> he doesn't tolerate the people that have a religion, <laughs> which makes me someone who's accepting of other people's religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the way I rebelled was to go to the church uh, every Sunday when I was 12. Wow. And my dad was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm rebelling <laughs> against you <laughs> because you're so intolerant <laughs> to people's religion. Um, so... Um, I do not have a religion and I, I use more spirituality as a way mm -hmm. to grow and I'm interested in science and I read a lot of philosophy. Yeah. To answer your question. That's incredible. <laughs> well, to have someone like you in, in the role that you're in. And, um, I just feel like it gives you such a deeper understanding of life and, uh, and the way going ar about policy in general as well. And, um, I think I created my role, so it's a nice. Mm -hmm. It's it's not that I'm. It's funny what you say. Is um, it makes me think of. I created the role that I was good at. That's why. Um, that's why I'm in a good position, mm -hmm. and I could never. In in all my life, I almost created all my situations. Mm -hmm. I could never get into the box of fitting into something that people would want me to be I would never fit into this mm -hmm. um and it comes with growing up in a small town where um you don't have the whole comparison thing of comparing yourself to others because there's no others there yeah. were three other kids and that's it um which is interesting because again it's like the fear of other yeah. right is part of the yeah problem yeah. And you come from such a small town. I know. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I, I come from a small town. That's actually what I realized traveling the world was, I say, you know, I was bored and stuff, but it's actually super sheltered mm -hmm. compared to what I've seen around. And when I say it's poor, yeah, it's pockets of unemployment um, in France. And, but where I'm from, it's like pretty, I would say rich because mm -hmm. it's not so poor and it's so rich compared to the whole world and what I've seen. Um, so, so sometimes I reflect back and back. Mm. When I say I was in a poor part of France, <laughs> I need to really think of the context in mm -hmm. which I talk. Um, so I was a privileged kid and in privilege, uh, my parents are middle class. Uh, uh, so it's not like privileged, rich, of this, yeah. but privileged to compare to the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was not supposed to, I think, end up in being caring about minorities. There was never, I never saw minorities where I'm from and I would not hang out with people. Uh, there was not many. So I could have had the fear of others. I yeah. could have had, and so I think my experience shows that it's not about the context you, which in which you grew up, but it's also about... Um, your mind mm -hmm. um and how it's it's working mm -hmm. um so you can revert that mm -hmm. so i don't like the excuse of like i grew up in that place and that's why i think this way yeah i mean there's a reason why you're hot warrior this way but neuroscience shows that you can change, change those things and that's as a human being your responsibility the only thing you can really do i think as a human being is to choose your thoughts to your intentions the whole decision thing is like <laughs> neuroscience proves it more and more. Decisions are made 300 milliseconds before you become conscious of them. Wow. So you're not making those decisions. You're hardwired to accept and surrender mm -hmm. to what your body and, and neurons have decided. And your whole thing is about being conscious of the decision you make. And then if think of your consciousness as a pa control panel, panel or observer. Mm hmm and say, okay, I made that decision. It was wrong. As complete, assume the responsibility that I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Feel it. <laughs> and then try to hardwire the change in your intentions. I think the power intention is where you can rewire your brain. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole conversation about free will and is, is really important, especially in the age of social media. Mm -hmm. And how it manipulates the mind of people putting words and images in their mind. And it... So many people need to be more educating more people and we need to all work on this. 
on how to use it or what it's on doing. On how to what it's doing to your brain mm -hmm. first, and then how to use it for mm -hmm. good. I think a lot of the work of tech refugees is to rephrase the way we talk about refugees, to also put new images. And Up it can sound the... very trivial and it can mm -hmm. sound very, um, ha, I'm spending too much time in France and I can't find my words in <laughs> no, English. No, that's fine. That uh, happens to me and I spend all my time here. <laughs> it, can, it can sound very mundane and it's probably not the right word um, to do the whole social media a lot. And mm -hmm. we're known for that. Like people know us for being really good uh, at social media, thanks to our founder Mike Butcher, uh, who's a superstar. But also because we use we, we we have a lot of social media people. But like the effect it can have is really the fact that refugees come to our event and then they say, not all of them, but some of them I've heard say, "I'm not a refugee. I'm a tech refugee." Mm -hmm. shows that the transformational um, experience they go through when they come to events of tech refugees mm -hmm. is they come in, they're seen not as victims, not as heroes, but as human beings. And we treat them as such. They don't have like a tag. Oh, I'm a refugee. Talk to me. Uh, and yeah. they're seen as doers and, and empowered. So, yeah. And then we take photos, we put it on social media and we say, here were the engineers this weekend creating apps with the refugees. So amazing. We never say who's a refugee on the picture. Mm -hmm. And but it's it's hard because you need to compromise also to your audience. So what we will write will always be in a context. For example, I made the opening keynote speech yesterday at South Bay and I had to say Sometimes I said undocumented migrants. Sometimes I said refugees. And when I was rehearsing the speech with my team, they were just like, make it just refugee because the Americans won't understand yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, wait, that's not a way to treat people. Don't, uh -huh. like, pretend, don't say Americans won't get it. I think you're putting a lot of people in that box. Mm -hmm. Too many. Um, and also, it's a chance to educate people to the term. Yet... I felt a bit in the speech sometimes I was just like, I'll make it just refugee just because it's easier. Easier to... Yeah. Because I just have 30 minutes and we're not here in a classroom and I'm not cheat. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get a good compromise. Yeah. But... Well, again, going to the verbiage around it, we we're just talking about displaced... Um, dis uh, no. Forced displacement? Forced, forced displacement. Yeah. yeah. And do you... What is your, um, what term do you like to use? Um, I like, I, go, I keep on more of the legal definitions as a way to keep it real mm -hmm. because this is what affects most the lives of refugees. Mm -hmm. So I use refugee for someone who's got the refugee status. I use asylum seeker for mm -hmm. someone who's waiting for, for asylum. I keep to the legals. Mm -hmm. That's not yeah. when I, when we story tell on social media, we might use different terms mm -hmm. and we'll actually not use the term refugee because we are seeing human beings in the storytelling. But if I have to be speaking and uh, doing tech stuff, I'm going to be very like on legals because it's, I think it's important people realize that refugee is not an identity. Um, refugee is a status. It's a legal status that mm -hmm. you, you get if you prove two things. One, that you've been threatened of death for um, religious beliefs, uh, political beliefs, uh, race, gender, all of what you know, the usual, um, how do you say this? The usual, when you're on a crime scene, ah, usual suspects. <laughs> um, when you're on a crime and scene. And you have to prove that, which is terrible. And then, because when you have to prove that you've been raped and people are like, but really? Like, <laughs> you're like... Yeah. yeah. Um, so you have to do that as a refugee show that you've been threatened of death. And then second, you have to prove that your country couldn't or didn't want to protect, protect you from that. So sometimes you have a list of countries that are just like obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, Syria will be mm -hmm. one, for example, but some there are less obvious. And so going through that process can take a long time. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, a few years ago in France, it could it was like more two years to wait for your status. Now it's getting better. I think it was 14 months recently and they're trying to get it less. But what does that mean is unless they've studied your case and give, granted you the status and legal status, you have no rights. You're an asylum seeker. 
and you're not allowed to work. Yeah. But you have no rights. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but you're not a citizen of France, even though you're protected. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to work. And how are you going to go about your life if you don't have income? So yes, the state pays 10 euros per day for you to live, but That's how is it? it? How, how do you get dignity? Yeah. So you're completely in limbo. Mm -hmm. And I think that experience of limbo in the administration is felt by a lot of the asylum seekers, displaced people. It's a part of your life that's taken away from you. And Kafka was the best at describing this sort of um, emotion moment. Um, things that happen within you when that happens and when you know that you can spend 17 years in a camp, you can be born there, you can die there. Yeah. It's it's to give you the, the size of the emotional trauma and the size of the emotional roller coaster. The whole experience of a refugee is not what you think. It's not like the, the boat and all this. It creates trauma, but that's one minute, an hour, three hours. Then it's, it's also the like experience, the, whole... the 14 months it's the, or the yeah. lifetime I mean, yeah. Palestine. Yeah. Their generation. Their whole lifetime. Yeah. That's Which like, is, yeah. That, the, the, what it has done to the soul of so many. And, and I think it affects generation and generation because it's passed on. Mm -hmm. So, and we need to face them. We, I think we've come to a time where we can have those discussion and, and face those, but. Yeah. I'm very hopeful all the time. <laughs> That's good. Well, okay. Let's go backwards What? for a second. So you started Migrate. Mm-hmm. And how long were you, are you still working with my no, great? No, 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 no. I left. Okay. I had um, trouble with the investors mm -hmm. uh, and their way of seeing the vision for the company. Mm -hmm. And so when they came in and just like rechanging the sort of mission statement for which I was working and the uh, direction of the company and the way they did it, I just didn't feel that it was, um, I was, I was going to work for it yeah. anymore yeah it wasn't for you anymore it was not for me and then the founder of tech fugees yeah. had been wanting you to come on board for a little yeah. while so yeah finally you made that leap <laughs> finally i made that leap When i came was on that? the first day of the tech fugees event that was mm -hmm. created by mike uh in london he brought 300 people in 10 days that wanted to speak about how to create tech for refugees and with my experience of my great I was listening to a lot of stuff and being a bit like uh, angry because I was just like, I hear a lot of stupid idiots, <laughs> you know, like this is not the way you should think because sometimes I would hear, I was, I'm very moved. I, I was very annoyed by some people seeing refugees as like this poor victim and all of this, but you can't change people's minds. And it, it has, it, it hurts me because from deep within what I've always been working for is Basically, my vision is in 50 years or 100 years, some people say, but in 50 years, people will have that conversation of you were born in Afghanistan and you couldn't travel the world because you were born in Afghanistan. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's like 100 years ago when you were black and you couldn't go to the same loo. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so this thing will be proven by history that was just whole social constructions that were absurd. I think it's becoming more and more obvious that it's all absurd. Um, so when I heard at the conference people saying that, I was like, ah, this so they is not were... the way you should talk about those things. Yeah. And this is like, I'm super intolerant on these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not to get in a room with, uh, someone when, uh, with someone who doesn't know too much about refugee because I get super angry. So my team just helps me with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other day I had a fight at the office because one of my colleague was just like, but what's an economic migrant? And I was like, You didn't say that word. Mm -hmm. You really didn't say that word. She was like, what? I'm just asking the question. I was like, huh, I need to get out of this room. <laughs> so, but um, that, that's my limit. I, I can be very intolerant on this and I, I need to work on that. Um, so when Mike asked me, I, when, when I came to the first, I saw also the whole um, momentum that was created and how people were having conversation about what can we do together i was just like wow what has he created for three years i've been building migrate i never got people excited about my immigration yeah i never got immigration to be glamorous uh, and that it's becoming this topic uh and so it's just like he he's 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 found the approach 
to get people's attention and to rephrase the narrative about it's not about looking at them and giving donations. It's about acting mm -hmm. and changing actively every day. The way we talk about refugees, but also the, way, also the, the way we help them and the way we do it with them. And so mm -hmm. all of these things came in. He just like pushed the door that everybody wanted to be open. And yet uh, I... I didn't want to, first I had to, I broke my ankle in three parts. So <laughs> I was just, just like lying in bed for a while. Wow. Um, and he, I wanted to relax and, and think about what we were creating with Tech Fugees. And he was like, hey, um, come in and be CEO. Uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, and I was like, no, 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 no. First, I, I, I feel like this movement has not reached its full potential with you and you need to keep being the leader and the face and so the sort of CEO or founder role, chairman, call it. And I don't feel like I can contribute as a CEO and take the responsibility for I have not traveled enough. I'm a, I am in bed right now mm -hmm. for the last month. Uh, I need to travel more on the ground and see the refugees right now and speak with them before I can represent a company. That's so helping. I walk the talk. Yeah. And so I quit my flat um, after I was sort of healed and I went to the camps to the non-camps because only 20% of refugees are living in camps I went to cities where they were arriving I went to different places and just spoke spoke and spoke with them and told them about what I was doing and I was like seeing their reaction and it was not every every time the same reaction and it was really good to get their view and to see that when you put a label refugee to 65 million people that is the size of the population of France you're gonna get like different kind of people yeah and different kind of so it's it, to articulate that in a story that is still you human was so it took me a while before I became CEO and I felt I could become CEO in November 2016 I mm -hmm. think uh yeah it took me time to get on that role So what exactly does Tech Fugees do? What are some of the roles? And you have Base Fugees. Or, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So Base Fugees is our big dream mm -hmm. of a platform that could sort of automate our work and make it cleverer. Because right now we're using Facebook, Slack and different tools that are free, but which are not tailored to our work. So it's about creating a tech tool that helps us do what we do, which is First thing we did at Tech Fugees was to create events where refugees, technologists, tech companies and NGOs would come together to discuss what's the real challenge of these refugees in that place. Mm -hmm. How can we fix it with technology, what is already exists? How do we tweak it for, and the, in a way that it serves the refugees and keeps them safe and mm -hmm. not make them more vulnerable? Mm -hmm. So it was about creating technology, creating software or reusing software that existed mm -hmm. and then work out uh, how we make it sustainable. So we would have those hackathons bringing these people, they'd show prototypes. Um, some would win an incubation at a local incubator. So we wanted not to create an incubator ourselves. We didn't want to stigmatize a track. Like, This is a refugee track. Yeah. No. It's part of the design of the whole thing. It's like, you're going to work with your team on topic about refugees, but you're going to be part of a normal incubator that just does fintech mm -hmm. or that does health tech. I don't care. The topic is not stigmatized. Um, and so to ensure that the technology goes somewhere. If the technology doesn't go somewhere, at least it goes online and people can share their stories. And I think we always refrain from saying best practices Uh, again on words because we want to we all say uh, instead of best practices we share our inspiring experiences because when you share an inspiring experience first you're trying to inspire so you're trying to give someone a gift you're not trying to normalize and say mm -hmm. this is the norm and they should fit into that mm -hmm. and the second thing is you can talk about the failures and when you say best practices You don't much talk about the the failures, and the failures are the most important part mm -hmm. of the learning process. So we did that. We sort of had community designing events for creation of technology. And were you teaching these people co like how to use the technology? We didn't. You, we didn't. We we never. There was a confusion in the beginning. Is tech for Jesus to teach code to refugees, and we're like, no, 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 no. We're empowering citizens to take the topic of 
uh, displacement and create technology for that topic mm -hmm. to no longer be a problem, to no longer be something they fear, to no longer be something that it will put a burden on their community mm -hmm. and empower them to actually create more inclusive societies. Yeah. What are some things that have come out of it? Uh, the sort of technology. So you had, ah, uh, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, so many people have created awesome stuff. Wow. We had um, Aline. She's from New York, in between New York and Paris. Went to Lebanon in camps and just put a Skype connection to the refugees that could teach Arabic. Wow. And <gasps> she put them in touch with people in the US that wanted to, to learn Arabic. And do they get paid? Uh, yeah. Oh my I mean, gosh. Does it take much technology? No, it takes about using Skype. Then you need to be a business model and she's smart about it. She's like building a really strong business model proposition for companies and universities because it's super cool. Um, and so that's, that's so cool. That's inspiring and that's how much you can do. So that's Aline. But Aline is hiding. It's the tree that hides the forest. You have uh, Anne, Ali, you, I mean, I'm not going to say all their names that have created coding schools in uh, different parts of the world, in Jordan, in Iraq, and in Turkey, in uh, Berlin. Yeah, and they welcome and give them the tools to be uh, software developers and welcome them in the tech community so that people know that, yeah, there are some people working in your very innovative sector, uh, making money, making disruptive technologies, and they happen to have a background that is uh, a refugee uh, farm situation, a refugee experience. So that's another thing, but that's that's a bit different from a project um, for me as like Aline. Uh, another thing that came out was um, Comen in Oslo. They created a Facebook page for um, Norwegian that wanted to meet refugees. And then they turned it into like sort of um, connect automated, con automated connect button where they have a back our back office and so you enlist yourself to welcome refugees for dinner and oh you get an gosh. automatic text if when a refugee around. lives in your area match on your preferences you know maybe the language you speak maybe you like yoga maybe you know like and so the information is not shared with anyone else but it's but then they they um yeah, and then they it's match like, automatically, yeah, but you can match. accept, you can... That's and so and cool. to all of this, there are limitations as everything. And and we need to tell the stories of failures. We need to tell the stories of don't ask data, don't ask uh, data of um, refugees that is sensitive. Yeah. Sensitive or sensible? Sensitive. 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 Um, don't, you know, some will flee away because they They're have religious scared. beliefs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't ask them their religion on the, and then it's hacked by someone. So well, it's another topic I'm opening. But so you got all of these people that created technology and we're like, we need to find them investors. We need to find them incubators so mm -hmm. that they can grow. And that was our role. That was making them visible to the people um, in society. Be like, look, they're creating solutions that make us like more uh, together. Connected. Trust, yeah. trust yeah. each other in society. So that was the big part. The second part we moved in was like the whole storytelling around this community that was just starting to create a story that people would understand that there's a generation that wants to just go on with this and not be stuck forever with people that are not integrated in society and so become terrorists mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, and then we would take the fear and, and, and we, we would use that fear people have being like, if you don't help the refugees, they'll become terrorists. Yeah. So I'm going to trap you in your own game of mm -hmm. being afraid of terrorism. Um, so we did this whole storytelling advocating, cool. which caught I mean, the attention of a lot of media, which it. caught the attention of a lot of policymakers because policymakers like what's cool and to be associated with um, things that get you know votes votes <laughs> um well not everyone was like not everyone, with them, yeah. but the tech was sexy enough and not political enough because when you say oh we're going to use new tech to integrate the refugees it's easier than oh so we're going to put more budget into health for the refugees then yeah. like people have a different conversation mm -hmm. um and we moved into the third phase was animating that community so how do we create uh, collaboration because there's a fragmentation of people doing the same thing how do we make sure they partner there's a mm -hmm. competition not really like yeah. can we talk about a healthy competition I don't know I think the word would be uh, oh fuck I don't have it in English 
uh, emulation. Emulation? No, you don't oh, say yeah. that. Emulating. Emulating. So how do we emulate people in, and inspire them to also join this? Because the, the, the thing is on this topic of displacement, it's always been. Like, <laughs> to say it differently, the human species is a migrant, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we've always moved where life would be better for ourselves and to thrive as a civilization as a whole. Um, displacement has been more provoked by environment than Mars. Fact. Three times more in the last six years. Um, we have less people moving, actually. Before the Second World War, you had 10% of the population that was moving. Now we have only 3%. Obviously, it's more people because we were not 7 billion then. Yeah. But it's still less in proportion. Yeah. So what we need to think is... What is the state of the planet Earth in us right now? And it's climate change. Mm -hmm. So And flooding. how that's displacing people. And yeah. so how this is going to displace big time. And we know it. It's fact. It's like, again, I love science and stuff. I look at the facts. Hey, that was the whole point of the talk yesterday also. I was like, I'm not here to advocate for um, freedom of movement and open borders. Like, I'm not that kind of activist um, who's trying to... Of course, I would love, ideally, but I really try to root myself in reality is people are not ready for that the system can't cope with that for now because we haven't designed and don't have the people in power to design that system yeah and i'm not saying that there are good refugees and there are bad refugees the economic migrant as you say because first i i need to stop on this there's no economic migrant that's bullshit mm -hmm. an economic migrant is a super racist term and here is the intolerant me and what i'm saying you need to cut because <laughs> no <laughs> I, love it. I think people need to know i mean i don't even know the term but economic migrant yeah they're like oh there are refugees and economic migrant nonsense absurd <laughs> i know what people mean by this they're they saying mean there are good people and there are bad people come on this sort of way of polarizing the debate has been used and used over again to create an enemy that doesn't get us anywhere but to exclude some and to include us and so to sort of identify to the good cause and say the others are not doing like mm -hmm. come on just grow up don't say that you're better than others um so economic migrant is becoming this term where you put on people's um the idea that they have the intention to benefit from you and it's like, guys, like first the refugees are bringing stuff with you, with them. And it's anyway, we are sharing things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah, that's again, it's a lot of this idea of scarcity and fear. Um, and so, so they're I, saying economic migrant is taking. It's taking. It's those people who are poor and so they come to take. And that's what this term means. And it's super racist because it... Someone from Paris that goes to New York, what do you think they do? They're economic migrants. They are like trying to take and have a better role and, and, and uh, foster their lives, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't you see them as economic migrants? Well, they're not black or they're not poor, yeah, right? Exactly. It's, so it's then... the same thing. Is we say expat, we say migrant for others. We say like this divisive is, is just complete nonsense. Let's go back to the root. A migrant is someone who come from, who moves from a point A to a point B. That's 200, um, 250 million people on this planet. Part of them, 65 million, are refugees and displaced people. And I say refugees and displaced people because some have been uh, recognized as refugee status. Some of them have not yet and they've been displaced but are waiting for a status, right? And then you have, I won't go through the complexity, but yeah. refugees are part of the migration path. The only difference with them is they're forced to move for the reasons we know. Mm -hmm. We tend to try to say that other migrants choose because they had the opportunity for family, study, or uh, work reasons. But all of them saying is, I'm trying to be clear for everyone and educate and think differently. Um, so that message doesn't is difficult to simplify mm -hmm. because reality is complex, and it's easier to polarize the debate mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, In 50 more... years, I hope that the migration will never come back as a topic of instrument, uh, being instrumentalized. But it's always been in human history and we see it. And maybe it was for the better mm -hmm. that we always had to have a conversation about migration and each time someone was displaced to sort of address the problem. Maybe that's the way um, progress works. I want to talk about participant media and Ai Weiwei's movie, Human Flow. And how powerful it was and your thoughts on it. And and I want to tell you a little bit about 
my perception of it, seeing it as someone who's not in, who's not in this work. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was crying like the entire time. This Obviously good. it was so much. And some, of, I speak Farsi, so I could understand <laughs> some <laughs> of it. Oh my gosh. You speak <laughs> it? Oh, oh. Yeah. just from being around because the border of Afghanistan and Iran, there's some, um, I could understand some of it. And that was even more eye opening for me, just being able to speak the same language and, and know that we're the same and we are connected. And so for me, have, it was, it was very powerful for me, whereas maybe someone else who couldn't necessarily understand it was just reading the subtitles. Does it, I don't know, but anyways, okay. So in the movie, it was following everyone as they went from point A to point B. And, um, and he goes to so many different places Mm -hmm. and, I loved seeing all the different ways people were, um, were stay like how their situation was like in Berlin. Um, it was like in a big warehouse. It looked like, whereas in Turkey, you see them like gassing the refugees and, um, in some places they were taking away all of their belongings, the belongings that they had barely anything and then they were taking them away to try and get them to move. Or, um, there were kids running around and some, and there's like in their, in the little space that some of them had, it was so beautiful to see the art on the walls that from the kids and creating. And it really made me think of you create your space wherever you are, you know, and it's just, how you identify and the things that bring you joy and make you happy. And so if you had anything with you, that was really beautiful to see. Um, You know, again, like we want to take it back, obviously, to technology. They have access to smartphones. Who is paying for, how are they paying for this? For the smartphones? Yeah. They pay themselves, right? They pay themselves and then they... But what if when they get everything taken away from them? I mean, there were situations where they literally had nothing because it was taken. They're a community. They rely on other human beings to help them. I mean, a lot of them will have family just sent money over and wire it through Western Union. You have the Hawala system, right? Mm-hmm. The, it was a system uh, used by the Silk Road, uh, during the Silk Road, where you'd have people give you money on a trust system. And it's, you know, it's the region where it was working. So it's still there. Yeah. Then there's a lot of smuggling. There's mm-hmm. a lot of money going around um, that we don't know of. It's well, one of the areas had its own had created like its own economy. Yeah, right. What, you have like those the interesting stories in Italy, mm-hmm. where or Greece. I found there's so many stories of how the refugees revived a whole village or a whole industry. Yeah. So in Greece, the refugees saved the whole ferry industry. In Greece. Well, I'm freezing it as like a big thing, but they were going bankrupt. They were going to close. Mm -hmm. And then all the refugees came in. And so a lot of money was put into the ferries and the boats um, that are linking those small islands to Athens. So, uh, and a lot of taxi drivers made money from refugees that (laughs) arrived in Athens and said, take me to Munich. (laughs) This is really far, guys. (laughs) But I'm not saying they're You know, like, let's not phrase it as, oh, they made a lot of money on the back of refugees. Like, so what? They helped the refugee and they did it in an economic way. It was a give and take. Yeah, it's a give and take. And so what? So, and you have the stories of all these villages that um, in uh, in Italy with a lot of uh, old people that were a bit bored, like me when I was a kid, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that got refugees coming in. And then they could just bake stuff more uh, at the local bakery and they could have shared with them like their stories because their um, their sons and, and daughters were just all working in London, never coming back to Italy. And then they, they had new people that were young, that wanted to help Learn. with agriculture, that wanted to yeah. help. Uh, and the, I know also of French small towns where uh, there's been a give and take uh, relationship with locals teaching them how to do their food back in Syria. And so the bakery is not cooking new like not cool. croissant but yeah. new stuff uh, we know they're good there's good coming out of this super good so when you want to open to it yeah you know it's like how open you are to the foreign mm-hmm. 
And that's when you expand as human beings. So there's good. There's bad also. You know, there's people don't understanding each other and fearing and... But it's less common than the good. I've seen more good than bad. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. I'm sorry to say that there's just more good that has come out than bad, I think. What are, what are some of the things that you loved about the movie? Ah, <laughs> there was so much humanity. And I guess, you know, you always see the movie you want to see. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's always fun when you uh, go to see a movie and you speak with someone about the movie and they tell you they saw something completely different. Completely different, yeah. I saw a lot of humanity. What I loved about it is he really looked at them as human beings. He didn't make them victims. He didn't make them heroes. He made, he made all of them heroes, victims, human beings. He did everything. All My favorite together. moments um, is, uh, I have two favorite moments. Well, three of them, oh, so many. There's this moment in the movie where he's buying a fruit from a refugee. Mm-hmm. And the refugee takes like the five euros or the 10 euros for this apple. <laughs> and I was like, bullshit, that's not five euros yeah. or 10. He's like, give it to me back. I love his reaction. He was just like, no. Yeah. This is not because you're a refugee. Yeah. That I'm gonna, like, I, I don't have pity. I totally remember that. I loved it. I was <laughs> like, he's showing how they're trying to just like, he's trying to take advantage thinking like, oh, I'm a refugee. He's going to like, he's going to feel euros. bad. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, no, no, no. Yeah. And it's very Give Chinese. Give me back I my think. change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It made me, it made me think of a Chinese person. I um, thought the stereotype was like, they're very other funny. Yeah. <laughs> I love that moment. It showed a lot of humanity. I showed a lot of respect for this guy. I love the moment, uh, the terrible moment of uh, poof, going to an emotion to another. You know when um, ah, I have a hard time talking about it. It gives, it gives me the chill and it gives me like, poof, uh, let's be neutral. <laughs> um, when uh, uh, when when the refugees are outside saying we're human beings, and then there's this guy who's behind his billboard where it's written I'm a human being and he's crying when someone has to say I'm a human being and write it on a billboard and hide behind it I we've come to it. a really really weird place as a society and uh, and that was like a moment I was like killed by the yeah. movie another and last one if I pick is the moment where um when those two women I think from Afghanistan are in Greece and they're being told about the border I don't remember that one. They're being told about the border. You remember with this one because... Oh, that they couldn't go across. To, they couldn't go across. They, and you remember that moment because there's a little child that she has, her daughter. She's with a, that inflatable hat that mm -hmm, clues mm -hmm. do. Oh, and yeah. And she can't stop doing playing with it in front of the camera. And she... And yeah. she's making this funny, like, absurd um, thing. And it's and, funny with pinky inflatable stuff and the mom laughs for a the second the mom laughs when she's being told like you can't cross the border yeah and she says i didn't come here because i wanted i had to flee away from death and the girl just keeps banging and she loves she loves seeing her like the tragedy of what's happening for them and how they are trapped is terrible confronted to that picture of that little baby and how she loves about it. And the presence of that. Yeah, too. and undisturbed by what, what's really happening to them. Was well, just was... like this moment of poetry where the tragedy comes and they're still loving it. So many movies have captured that, like La Vie est Belle, uh, the, the Life is Beautiful, you know, about the... Oh my gosh. The tragedy and how he's trying to make the... Enfin bref. Let's not go into that. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> the concentration camp to refugees because I think it's bringing bad memories. And bread. But somehow you, we could discuss hours for that. Yeah, that I love that part too, though. That yeah. is so beautiful. And I, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah. How can she be smiling with her daughter? But then all of this is going on. But it just... She's a human being. Exactly. Exactly. That's why she loves. It's so incredible. Why? Well, I'm so happy that we were able <laughs> to just chat a little. And I'm just curious, what's what are you looking forward to with TechFugees? And what are you excited about moving forward? I mean, it sounds like BaseFugees. BaseFugees. So I'm looking for money for BaseFugees. I'm looking for money for growing the organization. Mm -hmm. It's really tough to get the money. Um 
because people want to fit you in boxes and we really don't want to fit the boxes. Like mm -hmm. people will, people, um, the, the, the moment at the moment, the people financing the, uh, innovative stuff are a bit not educated so much. So I'm trying, we are trying as a team to take them by the hands onto our world of why we're doing what we're doing and the way we speak about it and what the vision is because everyone wants to fit the box of what the whole narrative is. Let me take you an example. There is money for refugee entrepreneurs. It fits the box of they're contributing to my country and they're creating jobs. Mm -hmm. That's that's cool. Do it. I don't do that. We don't do that at Tech Refugees because um, we have refugees that are entrepreneurs and they're part of our, and we put them in front, but not everyone is an entrepreneur. Yeah. And not everyone should be. Yeah, the world wouldn't wouldn't work. Work. function with just entrepreneurs. Yeah. You have so much ego. I'm yeah, no, <laughs> but, but that's like true. someone needs to jump on board with yeah. someone else's. Yeah, plan. And, and that's it. And you, yeah, bon. and so it's also for several reasons. I don't agree that. Enfin, I feel torn by asking the refugees to be entrepreneurial. I know they've lost it all, and though they have nothing to lose, but. They've lost it all and they have traumas and the last thing they want is risk and instability. Yeah. So keep, can that. we put them in a safe environment First. where they are empowered <laughs> mm -hmm. to take action and not throw them into the entrepreneurship Which gets lonely and, and gets scary. Lonely and, yeah. stuff and they were already lonely. So, but you know, I, the people doing this are doing amazing work. That's just not our philosophy. So, Because we're not ticking that box and we're, it's not, but that's my team. Uh, my, my team at the moment is trying to rephrase our corporate packages and all of this. And I'm like, oh, but, <laughs> you know, again, like the intolerance towards, I'm like, oh, but no, you can't say refugee crisis on this deck about the, 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 and they're like, yeah, but they understand that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Or people have been asking me to pitch on, on, on the fact of saying, you know, we, we are responsible. We have, we are guilty and tap into the guiltiness of people in that region because they have a lot of money and they're guilty. And I'm like, I know it makes a good pitch, but I can't do it. I let my team do it yeah. because I cannot, I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I want to take people further. So I'm a completely idealist here mm -hmm. and I'm completely useless at raising money. <laughs> uh, so I'm excited about my team helping me <laughs> yeah. get the money to fund base UGs, to fund this tool that will help us have a co different conversation. I'm excited by many more stories with refugees that we can create, many more people we can get on that and to shift that narrative. Mm -hmm. I can see it how it's working. It will take a lot of compromise into the words thing we'll do, but it's not about uh, the good and the bad refugee. It's not about, um, they need to come here to contribute. Even if they were not contributing, yeah, we'd we have should to welcome be, them. Yeah. Because we're all part of the family. It's about what's ahead of us as a planet. Is this speech about mm -hmm. how do we allocate resources because we... And that's funny, me saying this as, it's a paradox, scarcity of resources. And I say scarcity is here, but the reality is the inequalities are creating the scarcities, obviously, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Things, but we still have to take care of the resources we have and they are in limited proportions. So it's more about intention again and making sure that everybody can share resources. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah, anyway. Let's not go into that, uh, but I'm excited. Wait, one more question I forgot to ask you about sure. social media. Yeah. And um, how the refugees are just, right. Mm. right? Like we were talking about how they're, are they on social media? Or how are they using it? Mm -hmm. That's pretty, it's like a general, there's 65 million people. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't expect, it's not all the same, but um you just have access to what the rest of the world finds val what they're deeming as val valuable. And I feel like if you're in a situation in that situation mm. and you're looking at what everyone else is paying attention to, maybe some, maybe it's like, sometimes it's like watching TV. You kind of tap out. It gives you a little bit of, um, It lets you let go of what situation you're in and just kind of. Reality TV is made for a lot of 
uh, there was a study made that people like to watch reality TV because it makes them feel better about themselves because they see the trash of people's lives and they're like, <laughs> I'm so much better than that. Like they're horrible. And I find it funny. Wow. I found it funny that they like to watch this. I had it was yeah. in France. I mean, maybe it's not in French people. No, but. oh my god, people are obsessed. It's that's a whole thing in and of itself to read into. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good conversation to have. Is how we like and hate those people. It's actually we like to watch this absurdity of the reality TV to feel good about ourselves. Wow, interesting. Um, yes, it's a, it's a it's an important topic you are raising because. I think, uh, I don't know if you remember when Aleppo um, was bombarded and it was the last part of Aleppo that was resisting to Assad. <sighs> you had um, people in Aleppo um, tweeting and taking videos and saying, that's my mm -hmm. last day on earth. Mm -hmm. if, I have no words to describe how you feel when you see a video of a kid saying, I love my life in Aleppo and I'm gonna die a few hours it just makes it like emotionally this is just a hit like a complete uppercut and paf like and then they see someone tweeting about their dog app or or like the Kardashians taking a photo of their butt and putting yeah. it on I mean I just want I'm just you know I'm just curious like what this is part of humanity go through you right like do you uh, do you lose faith in humanity no no ever no do they it's part of our shadow we're human beings they do also like you know um i don't know as you said 65 million people i can tell for their emotions yeah i didn't have that conversation so much with uh i didn't have the conversation i think with the people that i know that have had the refugee um, journey um, it makes me think the only person I think of right now is Aya who's in Damas and she's a volunteer at refugees she's in Damascus um, today in Syria she's always the first on Skype she's always on time <laughs> oh my god uh, and um, I've never met her and I hope I'll meet her one day um, I heard recently she went to Lebanon and I was like oh my god she got out I wonder how. Uh, and then she got back, I think, to Damascus. Um, because her family is there. Um, and maybe other reasons. But I, I can't wait the moment I'm going to meet her. <laughs> I've been like fantasizing about who she is and what her voice is. And I've seen her on video. I wonder what it's like because she lives in Damascus and she uses all the social media. And so she sees the lives of others. She lives in a country of war. In a city that's sort of... Uh, our part of the city is protected from that for now. I wonder what it feels like to live there. I wonder what it feels like to see others. I don't think she has any judgment. But you, you touch a point, like one very big question is what has been the impact of all of us being connected on social media, being able to share our videos, our interests, our emotions for the first time or for the first time for at a larger scale than we, we did before? Mm -hmm. What is the impact on migration and what is the impact on us as we see ourselves as a civilization? And I think if we were to read Marshall McLuhan on this, Marshall McLuhan would say the medium is the message. So when we created this anyway, it would provoke that consciousness and global village. Um, has it, has it not? Well, it's probably that it has created a global village that is looking what that is looking what we are and reflective of what we are as human beings, which is mm -hmm. unequal. <laughs> A big spectrum. A big spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also one of the reasons why I asked my group. I, 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 I was working at my great is the idea that first I wanted to fix that injustice. But secondly, it was just like they started using social media, all of them. And so we can never go back to the idea that people will want to move and will want to explore new places. Mm-hmm. They will want to migrate more and maybe less because we can work from anywhere now uh, and uh, you could be staying in your own country and just get all the jobs in the world so maybe people will move less but i don't think displacement is going to come um so it's a big topic mm -hmm. uh i have no answer well i love your no answer <laughs> thank you thank so you. much this was so fun cheers thank you so much <laughs> cheers okay thank you <laughs> cheers